Fine. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll start with the topic of gingivectomy for today. Now, gingivectomy. You can hear me? Uh, we will discuss the following things under the topic. We'll first have an overview of the history, the definitions, indications, contraindications, advantages, disadvantages, armamentarium, techniques, healing, gingivoplasty, and few cases for the discussion today. Okay. Uh, now, now, when we discuss about gingivectomy, the most important thing is you should try to understand the little history. The history part is more important for the postgraduate uh, people who are attending the webinar. Now, uh, the first person is Robishek. Now, uh, Robishek has pioneered the gingivectomy procedure. Okay. And then the first person to use the term gingivectomy was in 1912 by Pickerel. Okay. Then you have Auburn who said that gingivectomy can be reserved to cases where pocket is more than 3 mm. And Kirkland is considered as the father of gingivectomy, which is a very important uh, statement. And then gingivectomy procedure, what is employed today or what we are doing it in the practice is given by Goldman in 1951. Now, there are a few definitions of gingivectomy. Now, gingivectomy, according to Taki and Karanza, which all of you know, very popular periodontist, it means the, the excision of the disease gingiva. Then gingivectomy can be also called as a surgical procedure to remove the excessive free gingival tissue so as to enable the patient to keep the teeth clean. Or maybe it can be also called as excision of the soft tissue wall of the pocket. Okay. Now, gingivoplasty is a, another terminology which slightly mimics gingivectomy, but it is actually reshaping of gingiva to create the physiological contour with the sole purpose of recontouring the gingiva in absence of a true pocket. That is what is the main aim of ging gingivoplasty. Now, uh, we move on to the most important, the indications of gingivectomy. Now, gingivectomy is indicated basically in three clinical conditions. The first clinical condition is the elimination of the supra bony pockets. I guess everyone is familiar to supra bony pockets. Supra bony pockets means the pockets where the base of the pocket is above the level of the alveolar bone, which is called as a supra bony pocket. Then in elimination of gingival enlargements and in elimination of supra bony periodontal abscess, we use or we indicate gingivectomy. Actually, gingivectomy is a very time honored procedure. Now, the, nowadays it is narrowed down to various other procedures, but indications of gingivectomy still remain same. That uh, you can eliminate the supra bony pocket, as I have said, it is the base of the pocket above the level of the alveolar crest, and then elimination of the gingival enlargements and the supra bony periodontal abscesses. Now, moving on to the contraindications of gingivectomy, gingivectomy cannot be indicated when you need bone recontouring, being very specific that whenever there is a bony involvement, we cannot perform gingivectomy. Gingivectomy can also be not performed when the pockets are too deep, which may cross a apical to the mucogingival junction. And aesthetic considerations, and especially in the anterior maxilla, because it's the most aesthetic zone, we cannot perform gingivectomy. And when we want to plan an elimination of an infra bony pocket. So in a nutshell, you need to understand that whenever there is a deep pocket or whenever there is a bony involvement, in other terms, whenever there is an angular bone loss, or there is some other bony deformity which you want to correct, you cannot perform gingivectomy because gingivectomy will have an open bone. You cannot close back the gingiva. And you cannot do gingivectomy in aesthetic areas because aesthetic areas is the areas where you need to have a good amount of gingival margin and attach gingiva, even those conditions because gingivectomy compromises it. So we cannot indicate in terms of anterior maxilla and also in cases of deep pockets or infra bony pockets. Infra bony pockets otherwise means infra bony pockets otherwise means that you cannot eliminate the pockets which are deep or involving the angular bone loss. That is most important thing. 
then the next thing is the advantages of gingivectomy. Now, gingivectomy advantage is the most most important advantage of gingivectomy is technically it is very very simple predictable morphological result because you are going to excise what shape you want. Second thing is the ease of elimination. You should be able to eliminate it comfortably and you can eliminate comfortably. It provides a very good accessibility and visibility for the calculus. It restores the contour according to your choice and also gives you a favorable aesthetic results in cases of enlargement. Aesthetic result doesn't mean that you can do gingivectomy in terms of anterior maxilla. You can, but then when you compare it to enlargement and you do gingivectomy, definitely it gives you a remarkable difference which I will show you in your clinical cases. So that advantage remains always same. The various disadvantages of gingivectomy is most important. It gives you a gross wound, a very severe post-operative pain and lot of bleeding. Healing naturally will be by secondary intention. Why secondary intention? Because there is why why secondary intention? Because there is no flap to close. That because you are excising the gingiva. So healing is by secondary intention. There is always a danger or a risk of exposing the bone, and there is loss of keratinized gingiva because you are excising it, and there is definitely an inability to treat the osseous deformities. Whatever you do, you cannot treat the underlying osseous lesions at the way you want to. So underlying osseous deformities cannot be corrected with gingivectomy. Now I'll uh, discuss a little brief on the various instruments or the armamentarium which are used for gingivectomy. The instruments used are Kirkland knife and Auburn's knife. There's a clear two pictures which you all can see that Kirkland knife and Auburn's knife. Kirkland knife has a kidney shaped knife. You can see that there's a kidney shaped structure here and Auburn's knife is a different type of an instrument which is actually used only for interdental areas. Auburn's knife can also be used in flap procedures also because basically it targets the interdental area. You can see the figure and try to analyze how Kirkland knife and Auburn's knife can be used. I will show you a clinical picture where you can see the application. Here you can very clearly see that how a Kirkland knife can be used. It's a kidney shaped yeah, and is used to give the incision and used to excise by the external bevel gingivectomy. Then you have Auburn's knife application. Auburn's knife is this is the Auburn's knife. It basically after the Kirkland knife, you can use Auburn's knife and you can remove the interdental gingiva, which is the most, most intact gingiva and you need to remove it without tearing the whole gingival tissue or the remaining tissue. The next important is the most important instrument, which is called as a crane Kaplan pocket marker. Undergraduates listening to me, these are all different types of uh, uh, very short questions, which are important for your exam, focusing on undergraduates. Then crane, uh, crane Kaplan pocket marker is one very important question and knife soft gingivectomy is also one very important thing. Now, when you consider the, the uh, crane Kaplan pocket marker, you can see that it is nothing but like a tweezer, but then you can see here a pointed edge. So basically punches on the pocket where you want to give the incision. So you can see this is how we insert the smooth part goes in the gingiva and the and the sharpened part is outside and you punch. So when you punch, what you create is a breeding point. The breeding point can be created by an explorer also. But then breeding point, ideally, you measure the pocket. So you will come to know what depth the pocket is going and then you punch it from the outside. So this is an importance of a crane Kaplan pocket marker. Okay. Now, uh, you can also use uh, electrosurgical units for doing gingivectomy. You have electrosurgical uh, uh, unit is there and you have got the most important speciality of an electrosurgical unit is the various tips it has got. It has got a tip which is rhomboid, it has got a loop, it has got a needle and a ball. You have a ball shape, you have various shapes of the electrosurgical unit and its tips which you can use at the various uh, indications wherever you want to. Every tip you cannot use to do everything. If you want to excise or incise, you have to use needle. The uh, ball electrode is basically for coagulation, which is called electrocoagulation. Then you have got a loop electrode. Loop, loop can be also used to excise, especially loop is used for gingivoplasty and even especially uh, it is used for doing the uh, opiculectomy where you hold the periconal flap in the loop and then you directly try to uh, electrically you can excise it. So that is also one of the important uses of this one. Then uh, here I'm showing you the various applications of diode lasers. 
Diode lasers can be used for gingivectomy. You have got diode lasers, a range of 810 to 980 nanometers. I'm showing you the commercially available diode, which are available in India and we are using it. I have used all of them. You have Picasso, you have Serona, you have Biolay, you have Solar, all of them are diode. All the varieties are available. Okay. Then you have got the various techniques for gingivectomy. As I said, you have got a scalpel gingivectomy, you have got an electrosurgical gingivectomy, a chemical gingivectomy and a laser gingivectomy. Whatever type of gingivectomy is needed, we have all the four types of gingivectomies based upon what type of instruments we are planning to use. Considering that we are using a scalpel gingivectomy, it was introduced by a person called Goldman. I have already told you that the present day gingivectomy is pioneered by Goldman. And uh, Goldman has described various steps and as usual, we follow the regular protocol of anesthesia, marking the pockets with the grain cup plant pocket marker, giving external bevel incisions, removing the pocket wall and then covering the area with the surgical pack. You have got two types of incisions. You can give a continuous incision or a discontinuous incisions. Continuous incisions start from, start from distal tooth, go to the anterior tooth or in discontinuous incisions, you have to start from distal line angle of one tooth, then go to the next tooth and stop at every area. But you have to make sure that the incisions overlap and they should fuse with each other. But you have to give repeated incisions. This is one of the examples of continuous incisions. You can see the figure. We have given a continuous incision and then this is a curate and you are trying to remove it and the excision can be done by giving the motion coronally and removing it. This is one of the, the way of giving a continuous incisions. But then, especially when you are targeting for a palatal area, you need to be careful that you just cannot cut off like this. You need to make sure that you have to follow the contour because palatal area, you have incisive papilla here. You have the artery here. So in palatal area, just directly don't give a horizontal incision, follow the contour, go into the papilla and, and remove it slowly, carefully because of the, of the vascular involvement here in the interdental papilla between the two incisors, it's incisive papilla. So you have to be a little careful while giving the incision. Then one most important thing is while giving the incision, you always have to make sure that it should not form a plateau, a flat bevel. You should always have, always make sure that there is a failure to bevel will become a plateau and when there is a plateau it will lead to plaque retentive factors. Incision should be always given to form a normal festooning effect and incision should pass completely through the soft tissue to the tooth. Okay, now I will, I will just show you like if you really want to understand the external bevel incision and the internal bevel incision. Now there is one thing which I will show you here. Please look into this. I will, I will just draw and explain you the internal bevel incision. Now you can see here, now this is the tooth, right? Now, now always this is a controversy and this is our alveolar bone, right? And this is the gingiva. This gingiva is like this, right? Now, now if I want to give an external bevel incision, external bevel is always a pico coronally. That means the incision has to go like this. Is it very clear? A pico coronally, I will give an incision like this and this part of the gingiva is removed. When will I give external bevel incision? When the attached gingiva is sufficient here. This is the attached gingiva. When attached gingiva is there, I can go for external bevel. Internal bevel is something like this. I am giving corona apically towards the alveolar crest, leaving 0.5 to 1 mm of marginal gingiva. This is the difference between external bevel and internal bevel. All the undergraduates, postgraduates need to understand this because external bevel incision is given apicocoronally and internal bevel incision, which is here, is given coronoapically. Now, that is why internal bevel incision is also called as reverse bevel incision. This type of gingivectomy is called as internal bevel gingivectomy. Postgraduates, again, internal bevel gingivectomy is also called as undisplaced flap. Undisplaced flap is other name for internal bevel gingivectomy, which is given like this. So now, one simple question that how do you differentiate between when do you do external bevel and when do you do internal bevel? The answer is the attached gingiva. If attached gingiva is there, go ahead with external bevel, excise the whole tissue and retain the attached gingiva. If, if attached gingiva is not there, if it is deficient, then you have to go for internal bevel gingivectomy. Okay. And then so what do we do in the crane cup plant pocket marker is that this is how we enter the crane cup plant pocket marker outside, inside, and we give a punch on the outer surface. 
that we will come to know that at this point my my insertion has to go and then this is extra part of the gingiva and this part is totally excised so this part will heal so you need to understand that the most important part of the of the gingiva will be that okay so now you have a so you need to understand that you have to give a bevel you just you just cannot give a flat incision and then make a plateau because in plat because you already know that how gingiva is the bone is and then the the more plateau the gingiva forms the uh, the bad is the retention of the plaque and then there will be a lot of recurrence in those cases you have to understand that then the most important uh, with the with the knowledge what we have got from the previous slides you can very clearly understand that when you see the figure a you can see the figure a incision is a correct incision because we have given the incision directly touching the root surface when when i'm sorry when you go for the second b incision the b incision and the c incision are incorrect when you look into the b incision you have to notice that the b incision is not deep enough suppose this is the base of the pocket but the incision is already excised above that means after giving the incision also i am still leaving the pocket there c is a third incision where i have not given a full thickness i have left this i hope this figure is very clear you have to make sure that whenever you are giving an incision you need to touch the heart tissue that means the root surface and you need to excise a full thickness incision is very very important so this figure very clearly gives the common mistakes what you can do as a beginner is the most important is the figure b and figure c but then very clear is the figure a where you need to give an incision i am again repeating the incision has to be given at the base of the pocket so that the whole pocket is eliminated the whole pocket has to be eliminated okay now this is a clinical uh, case where i will demonstrate every step of gingivectomy as we have discussed theoretically the first picture shows you an initial pre operative photograph you can see this is a very very clear case of an inflammatory gingival enlargement lot of plaque lot of inflammation red gingiva bleeding when this patient comes to us do not jump into directly doing gingivectomy with a blade what you can do is the first rule of thumb the most gold standard procedure of perio which is called as a scaling and root planing has to be done and then you do a scaling and root planing of the initial therapy you remove the whole plaque you make the gingiva little firm you can see can you very clearly see that you can see the stippling of the gingiva here we show the gingiva is quite keratinized and now the gingiva is in a position that you can you can excise it okay so the rule of thumb says that first srp has to be done which has to be done and after an after the srp this is a clinical photograph after srp maybe after two weeks you can call the patient and then you are we are planning an anesthesia you are giving the anesthesia you are planning the gingivectomy on that day then as i said to you the first thing is you mark the pocket this is the crane cup plant pocket marker this is a schematic diagram of figure showing how are we doing it and then you plan the area you have to plan where you are going to excise so you plan the gingivectomy area you even have an uh, surgical pencils which are available you can you can use a pencil and draw on the uh, on the gingiva on the mucosa it's a, there's a special pencil available for it you can use it and plan the area and then you have to give a beveled incision please see that you are not giving an incision perpendicular you are giving an incision at a 45 degrees angle see very clearly this is the line diagram to explain you you have to give a 45 degrees angulation to gingiva a beveled incision with a cockland knife is given you can see a beveling incision you can see that we are following the contour of the bleeding points and then we are using the obens knife and then removing the interdental area the gingiva what is there okay so that is removed and then we remove the whole tissue you can see that the obens knife is used to remove the whole tissue and this is how the tissue is removed it is not necessary that the tissue it comes out in one shot so don't uh, there's nothing to panic when tissue doesn't come like this so tissue can come in bits and pieces also but then becomes good if at least for your documentation that tissue comes out in one shot the whole tissue should be out of it because interdental area is where it gets stuck because then you are not removing it from the lingual surface so be a little careful remove the tissue use the obens but anyhow if you don't have an obens you can also use uh, a regular uh, blade 15 number especially 15c can be used 15c is a finer version of number 15 blade okay then you can and then again the most important you have to do the scaling because you have not done the subgingival scaling you have to do the sub you have to do the subgingival scaling has to be done gingivectomy wound after the scaling is done you do it you remove the sharp edges see this is how i am using the 
What is that? It is the most important instrument which I have discussed with you. I told you about loop electrode. It's a loop electrode. It basically also does gingivoplasty. It also controls the bleeding, hemostasis, and cleansing the wound. You, you, you clearly cleanse the wound properly. Then you can give a clinical view immediately after gingivectomy. And then the most important, the periodontal back. Right now, uh, now I, I guess you can understand that now when we are doing gingivectomy, you can see the clear wound. This is what I'm talking about: a gross wound. It's an open wound. It bleeds, right? It bleeds. So this 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 type of wound is 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 a, is a wound which has a habit of bleeding because it's an open wound. You can you, you you need to do that, and then you have to give a periodontal pack, and then at six months, this is how the patient. Isn't it? There's a lot of difference between the patient of gingivectomy pre and post, but then you need to maintain the pack because the pack will cover this area. You cannot leave open. Patient will have a lot of morbidity, a lot of pain. Patient cannot eat properly till the healing period. So you give a pack for 14 days, remove the pack. Uh, if preferable, you can give some uh, ointments or some healing gels to apply to massage, and then at six months post-operative view is this. Uh, these are also a few of the cases where you can look into the inflammatory enlargement here and then after the post-gingivectomy and uh, most of the cases during orthocomplores because it's all hyperplastic because of the very poor plaque control because of the braces, patient then you can do gingivectomy. Now the reason is why do you want to gingivectomy when the patient is already undergoing orthodontic treatment, right? So the most uh, important consideration here is because the gingiva grows more, tooth movement is inhibited sometimes. But here, in this case, almost the treatment is about to get complete. And then again, you can see that you can see the uneven margin. So now this case turns out to be again a gingivectomy post ortho. You can do crown lending. Crown lending also is a gingivectomy. Even you can plan that post uh, removal of the braces for the even gingiva margins. Then we can do gingivectomy by electrosurgery. Electrosurgery, I've told you that you can use a needle electrode. You have a various diamond and loop electrodes also. You can use the cutting current is used and you can reshape it. So hemostasis can be the ball electrode. I've already told you about this. You can see that this is a needle electrode which is used to cut or excise. This is a loop electrode which is used for plasty closing or uh, controlling the hemostasis, the bleeding you can see here. And um, uh, this is something different. Nowadays, we have a portable uh, electrocautery. No one can carry the whole electrocautery unit just for uh, coagulation. So you have got a very good uh, portable electrocautery unit. You can just press it, just use it, and then uh, have a needle electrode and then perform the procedure. But basically, not much use because nowadays, we have got various other uh, advantages and disadvantages of uh, electrosurgery, which has to be considered. Advantage being, it is very good for hemostasis, but then Disadvantage being, it is not compatible. It is a, it cannot be used for patients with pacemaker. A bad smell, burning smell, and a lot of danger and risk for getting the bone necrosis, cemental necrosis, tooth pain because of the uh, because of the over indulgement of the electrodes. So you have to be a little careful in using electrosurgery. And most important, it is it's, a, it's, it's not portable. It's, it's, a, it's a big unit for you to carry. The unit. Then, then uh, previously they used to perform gingivectomy by chemosurgery by putting some chemicals, especially you have got 5% paraformaldehyde, which is called as antiformin. But then the most important disadvantage being you put chemical on gingiva, how do you control? Where will it flow? You don't know the depth, you don't know what shape you're going to cut, you don't know how it's going to form, and then it also hurts and troubles your, your, your patient's lips, your patient's mucosa, and then the junctional epithelium maybe it creates issues also, and bone also. That is why this is not used procedure. It's already extinct procedures now. And then comes the uh, the most popular, the, the, the present day treatment is laser gingivectomy. This is one of the cases where we can, I have, I have discussed with you about laser gingivectomy, the various advantages being all advantages which mimics electrosurgery and the disadvantages of electrosurgery can be used here because laser is not only used for hemostasis, but laser is also used because it also causes antibacterial action in the particular area and also causes less recurrence because it penetrates deep. Electrosurgery doesn't penetrate. There's a very common question between electrosurgery and laser. Laser has many more therapeutic benefits compared to electrosurgery. So uh, this is one of the case. Uh, this case was a, a sturge web of patient and then uh, we have planned gingivectomy. We have to use diode laser and this is how it's an immediate post-op picture. And then this is the uh, one month post op picture. You can see the difference between the gingival margins. This is also one of the cases where there is an epulis here between the incisor and the lateral. Diode laser is used, immediate post op and post operative healing. Now, these are all advantages of laser because the vectomy can be performed comfortably. 
but then you have to make sure that the depth should not be if it is more fiber optic then you have to increase the watts of laser or you have to also use the scan but then laser has definitely uh, edge over electrosurgery because i said you there are a lot of advantages which i may repeat if you have any queries later uh, you can see that there is a forced uh, eruption of central incisor because of that you have an uneven margin this is what happens that we, uh, this is can be also because of an uh, most important common cause for uneven gingival margin is the uh, passive eruption issues so you can you can you can you can use it and then uh, okay immediately following laser gingivectomy this is a picture now okay then you can you have uh, one of the very important uh, case here then you can see the clear case of laser gingivectomy done. Then you have healing after gingivectomy, a little boring part here. Uh, I'll just uh, cut short healing because it is, it is by secondary intention and you know that as the healing happens, all the cells will gather. There will be a clot formation on the surgical wound after two days, there will be necrosis, there will be leukocyte cells accumulating there, epithelial will start growing. And most important again, post graduates that cells advance by tumbling action. Tumbling action is an action we seen in the healing of gingivectomy. Then you see that slowly the epithelialization begins, the cells gather at 8 days. Small part of the wound surface get an epithelialized, but mostly at the 8 to 14 days, the epithelialization gets complete. On 14 days, you can see that it's almost 2 weeks. That's why we call the patients for 2 weeks post-operative, because the epithelialization completes. If you want the total epithelial repair, it takes 1 month. And if you want a total connective tissue repair, it takes 7 to 8 weeks, which is nearly 2 months. It's a very important question that uh, epithelialization takes nearly one month to complete, but partial epithelialization, it begins at 24 hours, completes at seven days, but 100% completion at the end of one month. And that is why we call the patients after one month is an answer. That why do we recall the patients after one month of gingivitis treatment? And then for, and for the treatment of the connective tissue, we recall the patients after seven to eight weeks, which is nearly two months. Uh, this is one of the cases where uh, laser gingivectomy was planned. Uh, the patient had inflammatory enlargement, quite fibrotic scaling was done. And this is a post-operative view. You can very clearly and nicely see the finished lines, which is prepared by the crown uh, margins. Okay, for the crown margins, the finished lines are clearly prepared. And this is how we need to excise immediately. The advantage of laser gingivectomy is you can do it immediately. You don't need to recall the patient you don't need to send the patient back. You can do it immediately, make an impression, go ahead with temporaries immediately. There is because there is no bleeding and, and there is there is also a, a very low chances of getting infection. So you can even avoid antibiotics and give an the success SOS whenever necessary. You can do that. Okay. Now the last part of it is gingivoplasty, which I have said is artificially reshaping the gingiva, which is to create the physiological contours. And the technique is similar, but the purpose is little different. Gingivectomy is done to eliminate the pocket where plasty is done. Sole purpose of recontent it. You can use knives, you can use burst stones, and even electropottery electrodes can be also used. This is one of the cases where they have used the uh, diamond loop burst, uh, diamond loop electrode for electrosurgery. And this is post-operative. You can use lasers. You can use a uh, few people initially. Uh, use birds, diamond post birds to use it. This is one of the cases where I have used birds to, uh, which is called a ginger touch, which is basically used. And the, the same method is also applied for doing depigmentation with birds, is also used. So, this is also a uh, most important uh, uh, concept. But then it was, it is, it is now uh, no more used because of the patient mobility. And there's again, there's no control on the reshaping of gingiva. So, gingivoplasty, most important indication is being is used for NUG. And this is a very important question for need for the people who are appearing for that, that gingivoplasty or which surgical procedure is indicated for enough patients. Answer is gingivoplasty. Never attempt flap and all. So that's one of the most important controversial questions uh, which comes up with that. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening.